I'm Indy Nidell, and this is another exciting episode of Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in the Chair of Wisdom and answer your questions about the First World War. Colin Taylor writes, Hi Indy, greetings from Seattle. Uh, at this time, Germany had a very liberal assembly. Why would they keep funding a war that the populace at large didn't want? The liberal side of the Reichstag was split into two camps since 1880, actually. Uh, there was the National Liberals and the Links Liberale, which were the left-leaning liberals. Uh, the National Liberals were the stronger faction just before the war. And even though they were in name liberal, they were actually really nationalistic and had supported Bismarck's policies and were in favor of things like imperialism, right? They were actually the party that demanded things like new colonies. So, together with the conservatives, they held a strong position. The biggest push against the war, though, would actually come from SPD, the Social Democrats. Um, with 34% of the vote in 1912, they were the rising voice of Germany's lower classes and were actually mostly against the war. But, and long backstory, as the Kaiser famously said, he didn't know parties anymore, only Germans. And the feeling of being needed in this time of turmoil as the war was breaking out was too strong even in a leftist party. As the Reichstag voted by ballot for or against new war loans in December 1914, the majority of the SPD agreed and they voted to keep the war going. The party then split and the pacifistic and more socialistic left-wingers joined a new party, the USPD. That's a good question. Uh, NX945 writes, How did the war benefit or hinder the evolution of socialist or working-class movements in the fighting countries? The outbreak of the war in 1914 threw most socialist parties in Europe into a big identity crisis. But despite inner turmoil, all of them voted in favor of the war aims of their various countries. Now, during the war, socialists and social democrats had big ideological fallouts and many left-wing parties split up into radicals and moderates. Um, the socialists often accused the social democrats of betraying the working class by supporting the war. The biggest impact from radical socialist parties was of course felt in Russia where the Tolstoyan movement under Bulgakov, uh, the already established Bolsheviki, and later the revolutionists under Lenin, uh, propagated a strongly Marxist and pacifistic political change. Besides that, it was in fact the Social Democratic Party of Germany that was the biggest socialist voice in European parliaments. German socialists like Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg uh, had strong connections to Lenin or to Trotsky, and both Russia and Germany, as you may know, or as you will find out, would both later succumb to revolution and even civil war. The longevity of the war, uh, its cruelty, and the overall enormous number of casualties had a big impact on the post-war societies, the post-war socialist societies in France, Britain, the USA, and even neutral countries like Sweden and Spain. Spain was later torn apart between socialists and nationalists. Mussolini's fascist movement in Italy was born out of socialistic ideas, and Germany would later bear the swastika of national socialism. Worker movements in Britain and the USA fought for better working and living conditions, and the ideas of the commune, which were long believed dead, rose up once again in France. So, you know, everywhere. Um, Eduarde Johanna says, It would be very delightful to have a question answered in Out of the Trenches. Well, I guess I'm going to delight you now, Eduarda. So here comes another question. How was the medicine at the front line, and what was common when these doctors get injured or died? The soldiers simply lied to die, I guess laid down to die. Very much loving the show. Okay. We well, have to make the difference between frontline medics and the hospitals behind the lines. Lying wounded and bleeding in the ruins of a battlefield or in no man's land, yeah, was often a death sentence if you weren't lucky enough to have a comrade that dragged you out in time or, or you could crawl back to your own lines on your own. 
Um, every soldier, at least on the Western Front, had to carry bandages to treat smaller wounds. But your chances of survival were pretty slim if you got a more serious wound, even if a squad medic was able to retrieve you. Um, maybe by night, maybe in a short truce, or maybe often even under fire. But even if you were carried back to the trenches, the medical officers couldn't do much more than, you know, keeping you warm, giving you a tetanus shot against infections, or trying to prevent shock. Sometimes, wounded soldiers had to lay in the trenches for days while the battle was still going on all around you and there was no way to get you out of there. After that, you might reach a field hospital behind the lines. Now, from then on, your chances were pretty good that you would survive, if your wounds were not already infected, of course. Uh, most field hospitals were pretty much up to date with modern medicine at the time. They had operating tables, they had x-rays, uh, morphine, chloroform, transfusions. Doctors rarely got killed so far behind the front lines, and the Red Cross was pretty widely respected. Um, nobody really intended to shell field hospitals and medical personnel, but, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen by accident, of course. Um, and soldiers still died on the operating table or never recovered from their wounds. But in general, if you made it to the professional doctors or nurses, your chances of survival were pretty high. We should and we will make at least one special about medicine during the First World War. But for now, if you'd like to check out the bio of a very famous nurse from the war, you can click right here for our special on Edith Cavill. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.